And we're back. I hear a demolition derby going on. What is being destroyed? Oh, look at that. <laughs> really, Luke? <laughs> really? You had to do that right there. We're about to start the Bible study. And you had to do this right here. Really, Luke? This seemed like a good idea for you. Will you get your stuff out of here? I'm trying to work. I can't even find my chair. Thank you. Good night. Whoa. Well, I, I guess we have a water thing installed. All right. All right. But, oh, you got me to the Bible study? Yep. My daughter's coming to the Bible study. Are you coming? It's cold. Well, I got the cooler on. Alright. Okay, we got we're starting in one minute. Take a seat up. Thank you, George, for George, get off the floor. Come on, we're starting to go. We're getting ready to go. We're gonna start with prayer. I got your come on, dude, just take a seat. We're gonna pray. This is not this is not proper. We're about to pray um, behavior, mister. Alright. We're going to go ahead and start. We're on lesson four, part two, and we're going to be talking about the preservation of the Bible, biblical preservation. But we will start off with prayer. Almighty God in heaven, I thank you for this time together. Thank you for uh, George and Luke being here, and I thank you for everyone who's here in the stream as well, and I pray that you will be glorified as we talk about the preservation of your word and about how we can trust you, Lord, that you have uh, rightly preserved your word for us so that we may properly know you. I ask that you'll help me to speak uh, clearly and understandably for those who are here and that they will learn about the great work that you've done in preserving your word and about how we can have confidence in that and how we can be um, standing rightly on the, the Word of God in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we think. I pray you'll bless this time, and I ask this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. So, in review, we're talking about the inspiration of Scripture. What I mean uh, by that um, has been covered in the last, so I think, six courses. So I encourage you to go ahead and review those. They're all posted online on our YouTube page. And we've looked at what the Bible um, says itself about itself concerning inspiration. And this last week we began to look at inerrancy and infallibility and how they are related to one another. Uh, how infallibility actually is... Um, about the inability of scripture to error and is greater and a stronger dark doctrine than inerrancy. Because I can write something down that is inerrant without error, okay? But that doesn't mean I'm infallible. So for example, I can write down two plus two equals four. There's no error in that. That's an inerrant statement. But that does not mean I'm, I personally am infallible. So that's why we broke those two words out. And infallible is a stronger doctrinal statement than inerrant. By the way, scripture is both. It's infallible and it's inerrant. When we talked about scripture being inerrant, it means it contains no errors and also described uh, it with the meaning of what infallible means. It means it, it cannot make an error. It's, uh, it's prohibited from doing that uh, uh, based upon the fact that it, it comes from God. Because we believe that God has spoken, and we believe that God cannot lie, then inerrancy is a logical conclusion of those two doctrines. Remember the doctrine of infallibility and the doctrine of inerrancy. If God has spoken, it must be without error. Then his word must be infallible as well. Well, now we're going to look at the um, doctrine of preservation of scripture. Okay, so last week, inerrancy, infallibility. This week, has it been properly preserved? 
we're going to start with talking about how preservation is a biblical necessity. And by the way, as we're going through this, if you guys have questions, that's the benefit of this course. You can you can ask a question at any point in time. Just uh, raise your proverbial uh, chibi, and then we'll ask a question. Or if you're in the chat, just say, hey, here's my question. So we as Christians say that inspiration and infallibility and inerrancy does not apply to any modern translation. So I'm not talking about this. When I say inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy, okay, it doesn't apply to this modern translation that we have. And it doesn't apply to the copies of the original documents. But this does apply to the original autographs. When, when they're actually penned by Paul or by Peter or by John, that, that original penned document, that's what we're talking about, being infallible, inerrant, and, um, and being inspired. The original documents that were written by the men who were inspired to pen them, but we don't have those today. We have copies of those documents. Well, this is where the doctrine of preservation comes in. Has God preserved what was originally written? Or has it been corrupted? Has he allowed it to be corrupted over time? So that people might be able to say that we have no way to know today what was written in those original documents? Is there a museum that holds some of the original documents? No, we have none of the original documents. They've all been lost uh, to uh, time. They were destroyed over, you know, you know, whatever course of events. And we do not have any of the original pen documents. However, we have hundreds of copies of those original documents. And we are going to talk about why that's better that we don't have the original. Do you have a question? No, I just, I think I know why. All right. So, people might be able to say that we have no way to know today what was in those original documents. They would say because we cannot take what we have today and compare it to the originals. Well, this is a sword that cuts both ways. Because then we can say, well, you're right, we don't have the originals, so we cannot compare what we have today with the originals, but neither can you. So you can't say that what we have today doesn't match them. So it's a, it's, it's a self-refuting argument. The only way they could back up their claim that we don't know what was originally written was is they did, and they don't. So they really can't make that argument. And this is what's important as we go through this is this is about challenging um, whoever is trying to call into question the validity of the Bible, not just letting them stand on their ground, but challenging it. Hey, if, if you're going to say we don't have the original so we can't know what it means, you can't prove it. It doesn't say it because you don't have the originals either. So the, the important question when we think about this it is very well that we don't have the originals today, but we have exact copies of what was originally written. So then the question becomes, do we believe that God has preserved his word for us? That's the question. We will discuss this all through future lessons about how God has actually preserved his word for us. But today we're talking about what the Bible teaches concerning preserving his word. Let's look at what God has promised. Matthew 5.18. Matthew 5.18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. If you can go NASB, that would be helpful um, just for this time, Nathaniel. I'd appreciate it. Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth, I'm sorry. Yes, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Then we have Luke 21, 33. 
Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You noticing a theme here? Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 119, 89. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And then we have Isaiah 48, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Oh, that's a good one right there. So much good stuff in Isaiah. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the, ready for it guys, word of God endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. The fact that God would speak, it ensures that it is preserved. What God inspires to be written, he saves, he vouches for its preservation by his own word. God hangs his truthfulness and character on the preservation of his word. By logical necessity, God has to have preserved his word because his own name hangs on the fact that he will preserve his own word. Your view of God, his power, providence, sovereignty, etc., will determine your view of the word of God. It would be a pretty small God who would not preserve his word. That your view of scripture and your view of God is inexplicably, inexplicably linked together. Watch how someone handles the word of God and you'll see how they really view God. If we believe that God's word can be distorted or abused or is filled with error, that says how you view God. So here's one of the questions uh, that we think about. Mormons and other religions say God's inspired word was delivered to us originally, but has not been preserved. What does that say about their view of God? That says something about your view of God that would be inspired, and then he would allow men to corrupt his word? Man has free will, so man has corrupted it over time. And God doesn't violate man's will, free will, does he? Well, this is the response. And this is an example that, um, that Jim brought up that I thought was pretty good. He said, okay, let's say I have a three-year-old three son who picks up a hammer and decides that he wants to hit everything that is glass in the house with the hammer and smash all the drywall. Do you think that I, as one who is more powerful and sovereign than he is, is going to violate his free will to keep him from destroying that which is precious to me? Well, yes, of course, you're going to stop him. Well, that is exactly what God has done with his word. God has kept those of us who are on earth who would wish to corrupt or distort his word from doing so. God overrides the free will of men. Did I just say that? Did, did I just say that God overrides the free will of men? What does override mean? It means um, is more powerful than it. takes control. Yeah. And the answer well, is yes. Really don't know. They're so big. And I would say, obviously yes, because I'm saved. And that wasn't my will to follow God initially. But ten years ago, he overrode my will and made sure that I would be saved, and I'm grateful for it. So it also ties into salvation. So, if your view of God is that he would never violate human free will or sovereignty, 
then you really need to explain how it is that God would preserve his word. Or, I added this, how anyone would be saved. Look at emperors and many powerful men who have wanted to ride or rid the world of God's word and explain how it is preserved if he didn't violate our free will. Human will always bows the knee to divine sovereignty. If God intends to do something, there is no amount of human will that will overcome it. That is why the preservation of the Bible is necessary. So that's that's preservation of the Bible from the biblical point of view. Preservation of the Bible as a logical necessity. Preservation is a logical necessity of inspiration and if inspiration and inerrancy is true. If God has spoken without error, then he must preserve that revelation in order to preserve his own integrity, glory, purpose, and person. And remember, revelation is the content. Revelation, the content, the actual content of the Bible. That's revelation. Okay. Inspiration is what, what God did to make sure his Bible was written out with inerrancy and he is infallible. The person who wrote it wasn't infallible, but he, he used inspiration to make sure they wrote his inerrant word. And then illumination is what happens to us through the working of the Holy Spirit so that we will understand his word. That's what we studied in, in uh, weeks past. So, God's power, providence, purpose, sovereignty, guarantees preservation of his revelation. If he intends to do this, there is no power on heaven or earth that can keep him from doing that. It is logically necessary to preserve his own integrity. If God cannot preserve his word for whatever reason, you have a pathetically low view of God. And whatever that God is, he's not worthy to be worshipped. Arminians have a very real problem here. If God cannot override human will, he cannot guarantee the preservation of his word against human attacks. Uh, John Peter says, It says in Second Peter that it's God's will that all will be saved. But since everyone is not saved, does that technically mean that we override God's will? That's a great question. Can we table that? Because that's an application of God's revealed will as compared to his, um, what's the other word? You got his unrevealed? Revealed? Unrevealed? There you go, his unrevealed will. Um, but that's a great question, John Peter. Let's let's come back to that if that's okay um, after, the, after we go through this because what you're talking about is an application of his Revealed will. God says, I want this to happen in a revealed way, but obviously it doesn't happen that way because of his own providential will. Okay, so we'll talk about that. But to be clear, it's God's will, and this is gonna this is gonna shock some people. It's God's will that those who have sinned against him will burn in a lake of fire forever. And it's God's will that some of those who have sinned against him the elect will be saved and we will be but god makes it clear he wants everyone to be saved it's a free offer to everybody and anyone if they wanted to accept that free offer if they repent and put their faith and trust in jesus christ will be saved the problem is some of those people he says well you want your will take it it's a horrifying reality but that's a great question Okay, um, Arminians have a very real problem here. If God cannot override human will, he cannot guarantee the preservation of his word against human attacks. Mormons believe that God spoke, but that his revelation was corrupted because of human free will and Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormons were necessi necessary to reestablish the true faith. And it's interesting because um, that's also very similar 
to the uh, Muslim's point of view as well. Understood, George. So, his character is revealed in Scripture. How can he be properly worshipped if a man cannot know who he, being God, who God is, because he cannot preserve his revelation of himself? I'm going to read that again. His character, being God's character, is revealed through Scripture. How can God be properly worshipped if man cannot know who God is because God cannot preserve God's revelation of God? If he didn't then, it would mean that people later on, us, this is us now, people later on would not be able to know him in the appropriate way. God's name is at stake here. His honor, his glory is at stake in if he did not preserve his word. His salvation is disclosed in scripture. How can God ensure the salvation of the people? I'm sorry. How can God ensure the salvation of people if we cannot know his truth because he allows it to be corrupted. And now this is a verse. 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23. And I think that was the one we had a minute ago. Yeah, it is. Okay, there, it's already in there. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. It is God's desire... That his word then is the instrument of salvation of his elect. But then God allows his word to be corrupted by men? So that later on we have no idea what the original text said? Then he has undermined his own salvific purposes. In the redemption of his people by allowing his word to be corrupted. So, salvifically, he would not allow this to happen. You guys getting that? If God doesn't preserve his word, there's no way for us to know how to be saved. Very, very important. How do we know what the gospel is? Because God preserved his word. If he didn't, we don't know what the gospel is. We're not saved. He, I'm sorry, his will is known in scripture. How can he hold men accountable for violating his will, the law, and standards if he has not preserved the truth of that will and standards for men to obey. You catching that? If God didn't preserve the law, you shall not steal. You shall not lie. If that has not been preserved, then how can you be held accountable for breaking that law? You can't be. That's why it's it's logically a necessity that if that if um, he is God and he has he has given us his word he has to protect it he has to preserve it excuse me so that when guilty sinners stand before him they can be found guilty because they had his law his justice his integrity his salvific purposes his name his providence his glory his honor the salvation of his people, the redemption of his church, his justice, all of that hinges on the doctrine of preservation. Man cannot thwart the plan and purpose of God. So here's the conclusion. God works through his power, his sovereignty, his providence to ensure the preservation of of the revelation given by inspiration. I think there's a song there somewhere. The God revealed in the Bible would inspire an inerrant revelation and work to preserve that revelation for, listen to this, all generations. All generations. Not just those back when the Bible was first delivered but all those up till Christ's return. His name, the name of God that, that is 
that is holy, his name, everything that he is, hinges upon the preservation of his word. It's that kind of important. All right, here's some objections to preservation. How would we answer each of these? And by the way, before we go on to how would we answer these, these objections, does anybody have any questions? And that was a good question by John Peter, but anybody have any questions about preservation? All right. Here's one of the questions. How would we answer these? Objection number one. Man has free will and God cannot interfere with or violate the free that free will. Therefore, man has the power and the opportunity to corrupt and alter his word. The Bible, therefore, has not been transmitted or translated accurately. As we have discussed before, guaranteeing the inerrancy of Scripture is a very big problem for people who think that the free will of the creature always trumps the sovereignty, the sovereign activity of the Creator. Mormons, atheists, agnostic, skeptics, all raise this objection. Any cult that believes in additional revelation or the need to revise old revelation raises this objection. And I'll add uh, Muslims to that as well. Here is the answer. Man's freedoms are limited. Did I just say man's freedoms are limited? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Freedom is limited? Can you go fly if you want to? Yes. Like go out there, flap your arms, jump no. off the roof and fly? No. Why? Because your freedom is limited. Oh, that's what it means. Yes. We are not free to fly or as an unbeliever to do righteousness that is pleasing to God. God preserves his word in spite of human violation and activity. God overrules the will of the creature and directs it to serve his end. There's a great um, statement in Genesis 50 where it says, You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. This is which is the preservation of his word. So God overrules the will of the creature and directs it to serve his end, which is the preservation of his word. We will see this in the weeks ahead, in spite of the attacks on scripture and the attempts to undermine it, God has ruled and overruled to preserve his word. The will of the creature serves the will of the creator, never the opposite. All right, any questions about objection number one? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Objection number two. By the way, I'm very thankful you're here. I did not ask her to come, by the way. She wanted to come. It's sort of, sort of hard to understand. It is. I don't, I don't know if my well, you, mind's wrapping around it. That's part of what's going through this, and it's not the last time you're going to hear it. We're going to do this course again. Okay. And each time you're going to get more and more of it. This is yeah, the... Maybe, maybe when I get older I'll understand it better because I have no clue. Well, you didn't come through some of the earlier classes as well. So that's that's a problem too. Oh, yeah. So some of these things we did cover in earlier classes. But if you have questions, ask me as we go through. I'm happy to answer them. All right. Objection number two. The Bible has been corrupted. This is what you'll hear people say. They won't make an argument. They'll just declare it. The Bible's been corrupted. Here's the way you answer them. Show me where. If you say it's been corrupted, show me where. Because it has not been corrupted. That's the short answer. The same God who has spoken has promised to preserve it. This is a presumption that we need to talk about. All right? God has spoken. And he has promised to preserve it. If he didn't, then he's a liar. That's not our God. Our God cannot lie. So when they say that, here's how you can respond to them. Show me where. Another way to say is, can you prove that it has been corrupted? They would need to see the original and be able to trace the transmission all the way through to identify the corruption in it. Where is 
the, tri the trail of evidence that proves their claim. Uh, we're going to be going over a lot of this in the coming weeks because we do have a trail where there has been things that have been added to the Bible. And we know it. Why? Well, because we have the evidence. This objection begins with an assumption. Can you identify it? When they say the Bible has been corrupted, that there's a presumption there that's pretty heavy. What's the presumption? The presumption is that God cannot preserve his word. Yes. What's presumption? Presumption is something you think without saying it. It's something you already think. So, for example, when they say the Bible has been corrupted, they presume, they haven't said it, but they presume that God cannot preserve his word. Because if they didn't presume that, they wouldn't say it. They're saying it shows you what they think. They don't start by saying, God cannot pres preserve his word. They don't start there. They say something that shows that that's what they think, but they haven't actually expressed it. So they think that God hasn't preserved his word? They think that God cannot preserve his word. Oh. All right, so that's one of the presumptions. The second presumption is that God has not presumed his, uh, preserved his word. If you say it's corrupted, you're saying God can't preserve it, and God has not preserved it. So, the objection itself is a presupposition. But let's be clear on these presuppositions. Everyone, everyone begins with presuppositions. Did I say that enough? Everyone, we all have presuppositions. A presupposition is something that you suppose to be true on the outset of the conversation. I'm pre, pre, presupposing several things in having this conversation. Okay, I'm, I personally, this is me, I'm presupposing the following things in this class. Number one, that truth can be known. I, I'm trying to teach you guys about the truth of God's word, so I'm, I'm presupposing that truth can be known. I'm also presupposing that you understand English. Right? I got I got seven people in here, only a couple people have said hi, but I'm assuming that everybody who's here listening to me, that, that you understand English. We have all kinds of presuppositions that we bring to the table anytime we are having a conversation like this. We allow people to skate with their presuppositions, and we, being the Christians, end up defending ours. Sometimes it's good to step back and address their presuppositions. Point out that everybody has presuppositions. And when they point out that the Bible has been corrupted, they are presupposing that either God is not able or that God is not able to inspire scripture or that God having inspired scripture is not able to preserve it. But so just to be clear, a presumption is when someone just thinks something a presupposition is something that you think be th that you haven't said. Okay. Just okay, so when they say the Bible is corrupt, that's what they say. But what they're thinking is God can't preserve his word. Do you understand? Because if he could preserve his word, they wouldn't say that. Got it? It's something oh. they're thinking that's influencing what they're saying. But they're not saying it. Like if they walked up to you and said, God can't preserve his word. That's what they're actually thinking, but that's not what they said. They said a product of that, which is God's word's been corrupted. Well, what does that tell you? Well, you think God can't preserve it then. Do you see the difference? I think so. These are, these are difficult concepts. So you're doing it's great being an 11-year-old and getting your head around this. Well done. It's very hard. It is. Not a, I, I'm still trying to like wrap it around like what you just said. <laughs> well, this is, this is the way it works. You, gotta, you challenge your mind so that it grows and understands these more complex topics. And asking questions is a great way to go about it. Okay. It is important to point it out that they have a presupposition. And then you say, okay, well, if, if you're saying this, it means that either God um, is not able to inspire Scripture, or that God having inspired Scripture will not preserve it, or that 
that the God that revealed, that the God that is revealed in the Bible would allow certain errors to come in to his word. Uh, Nathaniel just said, good job, Rachel. Thank you. All right. The person who denies that he comes to the table with presuppositions comes to the table with the following presuppositions. Just ask him, is that your presupposition that you're coming to the table with no presuppositions? So here's one of their presuppositions, that being unbiased is a good thing. Is it? Well, that's a presupposition. That being unbiased is better than being biased. Another presupposition. Basically, he has all of these presuppositions. That he's, presu he's presupposing that he has no presuppositions. He's presupposing that he can be objective. He's presupposing that it is possible to have no presuppositions. He is presupposing that your presuppositions are wrong and his are right or hers. He's presupposing that you must have no presuppositions in order to have a valid point. And he's presupposing that not having presuppositions is superior to having presuppositions, even though he has presuppositions. These are the presuppositions that they bring to the table. Many times, we don't challenge them on that, and we need to. You have presuppositions that you're bringing to the table, and we need to be honest with this. That, you, that we're not dealing with the differences in evidence, we're dealing with the differences in presuppositions. You can see this in a debate over origins. Someone digs up a fossil, and the atheist and evolutionist look at the same fossil and come to two different conclusions. And I, did I say evolutionist? Yes. I think. The atheist and the evolutionist. I don't think it was supposed to be evolutionist. It was supposed to be the atheist. Because the atheist and the evolutionist, they look at the same fossil and come to a different conclusion than we come to, the creationist. Okay. So they, an evolutionist or an atheist, will look at the fossil that we look at. And we're going to come to two different conclusions. Why? Because they come to the table with a totally different presupposition than we do. We don't have um, creationist evidence and evolutionist evidence. We just have evidence and observations. We are all looking at the same evidence from the stars to the Grand Canyon to the same natural processes. The difference is not the evidence. It's the presuppositions you bring to the evidence. The atheist looks at a fossil and presupposes millions of years, long ages, death that is part of a struggle, an evolutionary process, some catastrophic cataclysmic events like an asteroid. They are presupposing all kinds of things. The creationist, creationist is somebody who believes that everything was created by God, according to the Bible, looks at the same fossil and they presume a young earth, that God created everything and that there was a worldwide flood, hence the Grand Canyon. We both are looking at the same evidence but are arguing over a different presupposition. Or I would say, I would say worldview. This is our worldview, is another way to put it. The way we look at the world are how we are affected by our presuppositions. And we fail if we don't challenge their presuppositions. The atheist is presupposing something to be true. If they say, you can't trust the Bible, there's errors in it, and it can't be trusted, you need to challenge their presuppositions. You're saying that the God that exists would inspire something and then not preserve it? What evidence do you have to draw that that presupposition is true? But they might say, well, you're presupposing that the God that spoke it would preserve it. Yes, you're right. That is what I'm presupposing. And it's not irrational. It's not illogical. 
It's not unbiblical or unreasonable to presume that or to believe that. So the God that I do believe in, he is a God that did it. All right, let's end with, on this um, objection, with the reality that we all have our presuppositions and we shouldn't back away from them unless, this is important, unless they're unbiblical or wrong, basically. Like a man could thwart God's will. That's a presupposition. That men could thwart God's will. If you believe that and you're a Christian and you're believing the Bible, you got to drop that. That's an unbiblical presupposition. It's wrong. Another presupposition that would be wrong is that the Bible is wrong. That's an unjustified presupposition. We bring these presuppositions to the table, just like they do. Here's my presuppositions as a Christian. God exists. God willed to communicate. God inspired men to write down his communications to us. That communication can be examined and known by man in order that we might have a relationship with God. And five, the same God who exists and willed to communicate had the power to communicate without error and preserve that communication for us today and for all generations to come. Remember, there may be other people who are listening to your conversation that you're having with somebody about this. So if you're talking to somebody and they're just needling you on this and they're not listening to any rational um, objections that you're laying down or challenging their presuppositions and they just want to they just want to lay it out if there's other people around then it might be worth to, worth it to have that conversation with them now mind you if you're just talking to them and they're just completely um, not listening then then you might decide that it's not worth having the conversation with them but just remember that there are other people around what is the definition of inerrancy again the definition of of inerrancy is that there is no error in what God inspired the biblical writers to write. It is without any error. Inerrancy. Inerrant. There is no error in it. That is inerrancy. Because um, there's two. There's inerrant and then there's um, infallible. Those are the two. So inerrant means that when God inspired the biblical writers to, to pen the Bible, that inspiration, what they actually wrote down on the paper, there was not a single error in it. Now, here's what's important. The men who wrote it were not infallible, meaning they couldn't make a mistake, because they can. But God is infallible. You with me there? God is infallible. Anything he does is inerrant. The men were inspired to write the inerrant word of God. The men were not infallible. They, they, can, they can make mistakes, but God prevented them from making mistakes. You're exactly right. God is infallible. He is also inerrant. He's both of those. You can be inerrant, but, but, but be fallible. You cannot be infallible and, also, and make an error. So God is unable to make a mistake yes so that's so infallible means you can't make a mistake infallible means you it is impossible for you to make a mistake everything you do is oh, right okay so that's god only god is infallible jesus christ infallible never made a mistake now we as we as people we are not infallible we make mistakes now the question is can we do something that doesn't have mistakes in it there's this idea that well because you're fallible, because you can make mistakes, then it's impossible for you to do anything without mistakes. And that's not true. I can do something that's inerrant. Two plus two equals four. There's no error in that statement. But does that mean I'm perfect? No. But did I, did I deliver something that was without any error? Totally. But there's an idea that, well, because you might make an error, you have made an error. And that's not true. You with me? Yes, I think so. Good job. Wait, I thought two plus two equals two. You're funny. All right, here's the conclusion, guys. 
The Bible is therefore the inspired, inerrant word of the one true God who has moved in history not only to reveal himself, but to preserve that inerrant revelation for mankind. What to... You guys are killing me. We will cover later if we have accurately captured the meaning of God's word when we have translated it into other languages. And this was something I found to be very interesting, and we'll talk about it later on, is that the word of God is not a series of words as it exists, okay? If we did just word for word, straight across translations into English, we would have a Bible that would be largely unintelligible. Because in Greek, word order can mean nothing. In English, word order is also incredibly significant. John hit the ball is very different than the ball hit John. All the same words, but the order is different. In English, that's important. In Greek, it's not. Uh, yeah, Epitome is probably aware of that. But in Greek, it doesn't matter the order they're in a lot of times. And it still means the same thing. You must translate the meaning of the idea to capture the essence of what the original language was intending for the hearer to understand. That's what hermeneutics is. It's understanding the intent of the author for the hearer to understand at that time. That's why reading scripture and say, what do you think that, that means to you today is a completely unbiblical question to ask. How do you feel about that scripture? How do you how do you think it applies to you today? How do you how do you what do you, what do you think it means? It's irrelevant. It's what did the author intend for the hearer then, two thousand years ago, whenever it was written, depending on Old Testament, what he intended that person to understand at that time. That's what her, proper hermeneutics is. Um, the question is. Have, and the question being the translators, have the translators, have they done that well? There are good and bad translations. The preservation of scripture is not guaranteed in any translation. We're talking about God preserving his word. If we have his meaning, then we have the word of God. How can then we have any confidence in the translation we have being the word of God. My response would be, why wouldn't you trust it? They are presuming or presupposing that we cannot make an accurate translation from the original, that the act of translating itself has not been faithfully done. I have no reason to believe that this translation right here, New King James, um, has not been done faithfully. The NASB, I have no reason to believe it has not been done faithfully. The ESV, the LSB, I have no reason to believe that that has not been done faithfully or that my English translation of the scriptures, which we can, here's what's important, we can go back and check that these translations are accurate. We have an amazing wealth of knowledge today and access to knowledge to be able to drill all the way back to the original autographs that we have copies of. We have hundreds of copies of. And I know Epitome does that a lot. Jim does it a lot preparing for their sermons. So, the NASB isn't unaccountable. We have the original copies of the documents and we can go back and compare them and know that it's accurate. There are people who can translate those original languages. I do trust the men who are experts in that. I have no reason to believe that the men who faithfully, sometimes over a lifetime, translated that scripture had any intent to corrupt it. And we can confirm this. And I added a little trust and verify. I can look at them and look at the original and also look at the consistency of scripture. And this is something that I added that I think is important. Many times people say, well, the original uh, 1688, I think, version of the KJV was inspired 
and therefore that alone is actually the word of God for us today, which is which is not true. Why? Because it has errors in it. As an example, when we look at God's word, we, we need to understand it never conflicts, ever. It's all written by one author. And here's the example I'll point out. You can do this today. In the KJV, it says, thou shalt not kill. Yet, God instructs the Israelites to go and kill. Many times kill everybody and everything, even the animals. So when we're comparing the Bible to the entirety of Scripture, why this conflict? Did, did God write something in the, in the inspired KJV version that was in error? No, because it's not inspired. And men wrote it, they translate it, and they, they goofed up. And we can tell why. Because you go back to the original, it doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. And as we know, murder comes from the heart. Not from an order from God or commanders for the military and things like that. It says thou shalt not murder. We can spot and know the truth. For those reasons, the Bible will never conflict with itself. There's a conflict. we got to go back and check what's going on here. Either I'm not understanding this correctly or the translators got it wrong somewhere, or the, um, well, that's it, the translators got it wrong somewhere. The, the word's wrong, murder as compared to kill. So when somebody says the Bible is in error, just ask them, are you an expert? Because I'm not an expert, so are you. If, if you're not an expert and I'm not an expert either, why would you doubt it? Why would you doubt the people who are experts? Many of them... They're a team of people. And this would be the statement that I, that I would say to watch out for. Beware when you have something that was written by one guy. Can we think of any, any things that claim to be the word of God and there's only one guy who's ever wrote anything around it? I think there's a couple religions like that. With the Bible, we have 40 authors over the course of 1,500 years who spoke three different languages, wrote it on three different continents, and had a multitude of experiences from kings to doctors to people who were common people. Some of them were able to actually um, eyewitness the events that they were actually writing about. And the entire 66 books, one complete story, inerrant and also written by an infallible God. There's no other book like it, not even close. And because of that, we can have a surety that God has preserved his word. So that wraps us up. we got a few minutes for questions. Do you have a question, Tamara? You were taking pretty good notes there. I know. It's, I, I have a really hard time wrapping my head around that. It's, it, that's why I we're doing I this. I only wrap my head around... The most simplest things I could understand. Most of that I couldn't do. Well, that's why we do this. When we're looking at um, going through these classes, it's it's to challenge you. It makes you grow when you're like, if everything's just easy peasy, then then you're not growing. You're not learning. So, so here's the question for you. What does preservation mean? Yes, it is, Frankie. You're welcome to join us. We got plenty of spots. So what does preservation mean? To preserve something. Um, to, what's the word? Like kind of put something, like if you have something left over, like a food, you can put it in a Tupperware and put it in the fridge. And what does that stop it from happening to it? Uh, like getting moldy. Getting corrupted. So to preserve something is to protect it from corruption. You put it in the Tupperware so it stays oh. without corruption, right? The, the question is, did God put the Bible in Tupperware? Uh, Spiritually speaking. <laughs> that's the point, is did God protect this? So we can be confident that when we read God's word today, that it is in fact God's word. Because I'll tell you right now, do you think that men have tried to corrupt it? Oh yeah. Probably. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> men have tried to destroy it. There are people who dedicated themselves to destroying this book. And you know what? Um, 
they failed. Did Joel Osteen write his own Bible? <laughs> Probably, I don't know. Uh, but there are men like that who have done it. So, all right? Isn't that amazing, Nathaniel? Nathaniel says he's, he's very impressed that you uh, you stayed here the whole time and, and listened. She's a very smart young lady. And again, she want, wanted to attend this. I didn't even ask. She wanted to join us. That's awesome. Very, very thankful for that. All right. Any other questions we got other than why is it such a huge table? We got George. We got Luke here being very attentive. Any questions in the chat? Appreciate everybody who was here. Dad, that's not Luke. That's Easter Luke. That's Easter Luke? Yeah, he's Easter Luke. With a yeah, and that's spider. a really creepy spider. I know. It's really... Isn't it really sort creepy? Of freaking me out. I know. I was the one who gave that to him, too. I should have never given it to him. Dad, come on! Oh, anyways... <laughs> No questions? All right, we're going to go ahead and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I am grateful to be able to um, teach this course that um, was done by Jim, uh, that he faithfully put together so that we would know and be able to uh, have confidence in the work that you have done to preserve your word, and that um, you must do this, Lord. It is, it is essential for your name for your honor, for your glory, and for us to be able to be saved because it is, it is through your word, which that, that is the power by which you have, you have used to save us. And I am, I am so very thankful that uh, you are an awesome, powerful, wonderful God and that you would communicate to us who you are and, and most importantly, Lord, who your son is, Jesus Christ, and how through him we can be saved from the wrath to come. And we can have confidence in that because you have um, given us your word without error and you have protected your word through the generations and you will always protect your word. We will have it forever and be able to be confident in it. And I am grateful for that, Lord. I pray and great thanks for everybody who's been here today. I hope um, even though there is a lot of information covered here that this was helpful. And I pray this all in Jesus Christ's name, our King and Savior. And my hero. Amen. amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Amen, amen. Amen. All right. Let's see. We'll close out with those two verses again. Did we you got... purposely write those today? Yeah. Okay. Put them every time. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of God stands forever. What a great confidence we have. What a great confidence. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you have a very blessed day. <laughs> we need to figure out the date for the boss. <laughs>